So last day we talked a little bit about polysaccharides from a functional perspective. What we're going to do today is hopefully have a little bit of a wrap up and it's going to address a question that I've been getting quite a bit about the final exam which is whether or not the exam is cumulative or not. The sh short answer is it's not cumulative. The long answer is it's kind of hard to delineate material from before and after the exam, the midterm. So how I usually describe the final exam is that we're going to talk about the questions are going to be specifically designed to address content from the second half of the course. So there won't be a question explicitly on material from before the exam, but you'll see from today that a lot of the information that we've talked about before the exam is relevant and is needed to actually address questions after the exam, uh, after the midterm. And you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So it's not like you can erase it from your memory and not remember it, but again, there won't be qu questions specifically asked on content from before the midterm. And again, we'll see that today. My PowerPoint slide advancer is a piece of junk, so it's not working for some reason for the last two days, so I'm going to have to kind of work from behind here. So when we talk about carbohydrates, again, when we talk about the functional aspects, especially, especially of the mono and disaccharides, they play a really important role in things like sweetness, color formation, but also texture and nutritional profile. When we talk about oleosaccharides and polysaccharides, they don't really play a role in imparting color to the system through malar or caramelization, nor do they provide sweetness once you get above three, three uh, carbohydrates or three monosaccharides. The thing that's really different about polysaccharides versus monos and disaccharides is that it viscosity enhancing phenomenon at low concentrations. Again, if you add enough sucrose into a system, it's going to become viscous, but at very low concentrations adding sucrose, it doesn't play a major role in enhancing viscosity. Whereas polysaccharides can start to enhance viscosity at less than 1%. So they are able to structure and form unique structures in foods with very, very low concentrations. Now, all of this has implications when we talk about the Western diet and especially processed foods. So when we talk about, again, carbohydrates, we differentiate polysaccharides based on whether or not they're glycemic. And what is a glycemic polysaccharide? A glycemic polysaccharide is a polysaccharide that actually changes the bl free blood sugar levels or the blood glucose levels. So they're able to be absorbed as glucose or as a simple monosaccharide, thereby imparting or impacting the a glycemic response. Now, mono and disaccharides all impact the glycemic index. When you start to talk about polysaccharides, specifically the non-digestible or the non-glycemic polysaccharides, these become a little bit different because they're not used as a source of energy as a carbohydrate, but instead they're fermented by the gut microflora. And if you remember, what is it that they're fermented to? What is the primary energy source that's derived from non-glycemic carbohydrates? Yep. Right, short chain fatty acids. And those short chain fatty acids can actually be used by the epithelial cells as an energy source, or they can be absorbed and, trans and transferred to the liver. So glycemic carbohydrates are, gly are, are those that actually increase the amount of sugar, the amount of sugar that's in our blood in our blood. So these are things like starches, amylose, amylopectin, maltodextrins, and glycogen. When we talk about the non-glycemic polysaccharides, we didn't really spend a lot of time on non-glycemic carbohydrates from a functional perspective. We talked about alginates, we talked a little bit about pectin. Neither of those are broken down in the upper GI to glucose. These are fermented in the large intestine by the gut microflora to form short chain fatty acids as, other, as well as other metabolites. Really where these are really useful though is again in structuring. We can talk about different long chain polysaccharides that are non-glycemic, things like cellulose, that have very interesting properties when you start to get them into the nanoscale. We don't really talk about them too much on this course, but there's a lot of interesting properties looking at things like nanocellulose, microcrystalline cellulose, in trying to create small, dense nanoparticles that emulate fat or that simulate that mouthfeel of fat, again, outside of the scope of this course. So what we're going to go back to is we're going to jump back to before the midterm and we're going to talk a little bit about how sugars again move across the epithelial cell line. So hopefully 
This looks familiar to everyone. It's just a slide from before the midterm. And when we talk about the different monosaccharides, different transporters are required on the epithelial cell. On the epithelial cell, we have two main transporters, one that's primarily used for glucose and galactose to transfer through, the other moves fructose through. Again, it's not important that we memorize these transporters, what their, what their names are, if they require ATP or if they require um, sodium. What's important to understand is that they require a transport to move across the epithelial cell lining. This is true irrespective of what cell that is. So when we talk about glucose metabolism in the human body, there are glucose transporters on skeletal muscle, on liver cells, and it, depending on what these transporters are, will require whether or not they require other active forms to, trans to, be, to facilitate transportation. So, for example, does it require sodium? Does it require ATP? In the case of skeletal, skeletal muscle, what is required to get skeletal muscle to what is required in a liver cell or a hepatic cell, what is required to transfer glucose across that epithelial cell lining? In skeletal muscle, in heart muscle, there's another molecule that's required to transport, glu transport glucose across. It, yes? Sodium? Not, not sodium. Even more obvious. Calcium? Even more obvious than calcium. What do, when we get a big spike in blood sugar, what does our body release? Insulin. insulin. So insulin mediates the uptake of glucose into hepatic cells as well into skeletal muscle. So these glucose transporters are important not only to transfer that micronutrient across the epithelial cell, but it's also really important when we start talking about homostasis. So we'll, going into homostasis, we've already talked about the GLAS system or the ghrelin leptin system for satiety and obesity. What we're going to look at today is blood sugar regulation and the concept of the glycemic index. So all foods especially foods that are high in carbohydrates, have a glycemic index. And the glycemic index is really just a measure of how much the blood glucose changes in response to consuming a food. This is dependent on a couple of factors. The first and the most obvious is the amount of food we eat. So when we take into account the amount of food we eat, this is what we refer to as the glycemic load. So the glycemic load differs from the glycemic index because the glycemic index is fixed to a certain amount or 100 grams of food material. There are meals that we, that we consume that either have a much higher weight than that 100 grams, thus the glycemic load is much higher than the glycemic index, but there's also serving sizes that are much less than 100 grams. If you look at a serving of M&Ms, let's say, the glycemic index there would be much lower than the glycemic load of a typical consumption because we typically eat more than six to seven M&Ms at a time, right? We take a handful. So the glycemic load is dependent on the amount of food that we consume. So when our body is in a fed state, so we've just consumed a meal, we get a large amount of glucose being absorbed, and that glucose in, the, in, the, in circulation creates a lot of problems. So if blood sugar is too high, from a chemistry perspective, don't worry so much about the biology, but what's going to begin to happen from a chemistry perspective? And again, this is going to the colligative properties of sugar. Yeah? Um, certain amino acids in your cells might become glycosylated. Okay, so there could be some glycosylation reactions happening. Yes, exactly. So remember when we talked about osmotic effects and colligative properties. When we talked about the osmotic effects, when you have a solute in high concentration on one side of a semipermeable membrane, so a cell wall, versus on the inside of the cell where that glucose concentration is low, we can actually get a gradient that causes a, an undesirable osmotic effect. This is why we have to regulate our blood sugar, partly why we have to regulate our blood sugar and our blood sodium levels so carefully is because they have that osmotic effect. Now, when we get a lot of glucose in our circulatory system, what happens? Our body begins to release insulin, right? It's saying that, okay, you have more than enough glucose for the brain to operate. Now, what are we going to do with that glucose? We trigger insulin, and that insulin triggers skeletal muscles to take that 
sugar out of circulation and to store it, right? And it's converted into glycogen or into different molecules depending on what the cell needs at that time. Now, as we progress or as time progresses beyond that meal, and now we move from the fed state, so we've got a lot of blood sugar in our system, we move into a fasted state. Now, when that fasted state is reached, or when our blood sugar levels begins to drop, we release glycogon, or we release hormones that stimulate the conversion of glycogon to sugars, which then release the sugars from the skeletal muscle back in to the, into the circulation, and then again, the blood sugar goes up again. And we require a very, very tight balance on homostasis. Now, the amount of insulin that's released is proportionate to the amount of glucose that's in your blood. So, there's very different profiles in how we talk about glucose entering our body. So if you have a meal, so here we'll have time, or sorry, we'll have blood glucose levels, and here we have time. Now, if you ate a food that's high in complex carbohydrates, very viscous meal, but there's going to be a significant lag time before that blood glucose begins to reach circulation, right? Because we have to have amylase breaking it down to maltose, maltose then being converted at the brush, brush border to glucose. That glucose then gets absorbed through the epithelial cells, and then we start to see a rise in blood glucose. Now, as that rise in blood glucose is happening, we get a simultaneous release of insulin. And as that insulin begins to release, that blood glucose level begins to drop again. Or that blood, the glucose that's in the blood begins to drop. But digestion is still progressing. So as, the, as we begin to digest, more glucose is coming in, we're picking up more glucose into the epithelial cells, transferring it into circulation, going into the hepatic vein, going to the liver, going through systemic circulation, being picked up by muscle cells. So it's dropping in blood glucose, but we still got glucose going in. So we get this nice, gradual, controlled release. Now, and eventually we get a plateau, and then we get a drop. Now, what happens if you eat something that's really high in refined sugars? So now, all of a sudden, we're not relying on amylose to break it down. We might not be relying on the brush border enzymes. So instead of having a nice gradual spike, we get a much more rapid, much greater, area, much greater intensity of glucose in the blood serum. Now, why is that bad? That triggers more insulin to be released. So more insulin gets released, we get more uptake, and we reach homostasis again. And this is fine to do cycle after cycle after cycle. But what happens when we chronically abuse that? What happens when we chronically push that limit of blood glucose? So when we constantly get these really, really high sugar spikes, what's the end result of that? Yeah. Type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes, how does that differ from type 1? Yeah. Exactly. So in a type 1 diabetic will not produce sufficient insulin. So they're treated by just giving them insulin or by giving them a drug that tries to increase the amount of insulin they produce. In some cases, they can't produce insulin at all, so they have to be given that enzyme to actually be able to metabolize glucose. Now, if you're a type 2 diabetic, the insulin production is fine. You're producing the insulin. What's happening? So if you have sufficient glucose, well, sorry, insulin, sufficient insulin, and you've got blood glucose, why isn't it working anymore? What's happening? Yeah. Exactly. So when we talk about those different glucose receptors in the, in the epithelial cell lining, now all of a sudden, when they require the presence of insulin, like in the, as in the case when we have skeletal muscle, they become insensitive because they're chronically exposed to insulin, so they become less sensitive to insulin. That means that it has a harder time, the skeletal muscle, taking up the blood glucose. When we talk about the Western diet and food processing, almost everything we do 
in the food industry increases the glycemic index of a food. So we can do a thought experiment. Let's take a seed, a whole seed, a flax seed or whatever seed it is. When you have that seed and you have it in its native structure, it's got the seed coat on it, it's, got, it's a very dense piece of material, it's very, very difficult to begin to degrade that. So when you consume that seed, what's the first thing that begins to happen? First thing will be exposure of salivary amylase and any gas, any salivary enzymes. Now, those are just going to work at the interface, right? Again, it's a whole seed, so it's not able to diffuse into the middle of the contents. It's structured, that structure of the seed impedes that enzyme from reaching the vast majority of the material. So then we orally food process it, we chew it, we break down the structure to a small extent. It then enters the stomach. Now, when it enters the stomach and it's exposed to that low pH environment or that high acidic environment, we get a swelling, right? We get a breakdown of that intercellular matrix, that pectin that's holding the cells together, and we get a swelling of that, that cell, and then we get some diffusion of that enzyme into that matrix, but still very, very slow. Now, when we talk about the rate of gastric emptying, the rate of hormone release, so when we talk about the ileal break, CCK, all of this is dependent on the rate of release of nutrients from that food product. Product. In the case of a compact, dense seed, the rate of nutrient degradation is far, far slower in, let's say, a flax seed versus a flax-based starch and a flax oil. Those will readily begin to break down with contact of the enzymatic solution. So which of those, the flax seed or the ground flax seed, is going to have a higher glycemic index? Yeah, ground. the ground flax seed. So even this process of grinding a seed the process of gelatinizing a food or cooking it, all of those processes increase the digestibility. And in many cases, when we talk about micronutrients, this is really desirable. We increase the digestibility. And as a consequence to that, we increase the glycemic index. So in the Western diet, when you talk about eating a paleo diet or something that has very minimal processing, compared to a modern Western diet where we constantly eat out of boxes, there's a major difference in how our body or how the glycemic index changes as a function of those different foods. Does that make sense? So again, a type 1 diabetic, the problem there lies in the amount of insulin that's produced, if at all. Type 2 diabetes is a sensitivity to the insulin your body produces. So again, your body produces more than enough insulin. It's the transporter cells, specifically GLUT4, that becomes insensitive to that insulin. And if it's insensitive to that insulin, it's not going to take that blood sugar out of, sorry, the sugar out of your blood. So the GLUT4 transporter is a really important, I don't want to say marker, but is a really important Aspect, what just happened there? That was clearly not me. That was so weird. So when we talk about GLUT4, it plays an important role in determining insulin sensitivity and insulin re resistance. So GLUT4 is the transporter that's responsible to move glucose from the circulatory system into the skeletal muscle where it can be used for whatever purpose or to be stored as glycogen. Now, if you get a, or if you genetically modify or knock out that GLUT4 receptor, you automatically create a type 2 diabetic mouse. So it plays an important role in determining whether or not you're going to become insulin sensitive or not. And this has caused a huge problem. That chronic exposure of highly processed, highly digestible carbohydrates plays an important role in that of the formation or globalization of diabetes. Now, there's another whole area of this that we don't really talk about when we talk about diabetes and inflammation, and that is the lipemic index. So who's here, who here has heard of the glycemic index? The majority of the class. Who has heard of the lipemic index? So a few people. So the, the idea of the lipemic index is that fat circulating in your blood is typically, from an evolutionary perspective, an indicator of starvation, right? Why is that? Because once the glycogen in your body has run out, 
and all the, you have no glycogen stores left to actually convert to get glucose, what do you start relying on for energy? Your fat, the production of ketone bodies, right? Now, when you eat a meal, think about what is a typical balanced diet in North America. So if you sit down and you make a dinner, you're gonna have, let's say, a piece of steak, some potatoes, and a vegetable. From an evolutionary perspective, is that the way we ate? Probably not, right? We would eat meat during the seasons when hunting was prevalent. We didn't have ways to preserve our agricultural commodities such as grains, so they would have to be consumed in season, right? So during harvest, we would eat a lot of vegetables. In winter, we would eat a lot of meat, and it was cyclic. So very rarely was there a time in human evolution except for the last two or three hundred years, where we would sit down and eat a diet that was really high in fat and a diet really high in sugar. Think about ice cream. That is ice cream. High fat, high sugar, delicious. But when you think about it from a biological perspective, what implications does that have in human health? So, you have these two contrasting parameters. You have your blood glucose levels, which is saying, okay, I'm fed, so I'm going to kick up insulin, I'm going to get that glucose out, and I'm going, to all of us, I'm going to drop my glucose by getting the skeletal muscle to pick it up. But at the same time, your body is recognizing that there's a whole bunch of circulating free fatty acids. This is an indicator that you are in the fasted state. So now your body's being told you're in the fed state, ramp up insulin production, and your body's being told it's in the fasted state to ramp down insulin production. So you've got these two, per, these two contrasting parameters that we constantly push. Every meal we eat now in North America has a certain amount of carbohydrate, a certain amount of protein, and a certain amount of fat. Does that have an impact on the sensitization of GLUT4 and the uptake of glucose? And this is a whole active area of research. But again, the really important thing to take away from this is when you process or refine foods, you are increasing the glycemic index. You are selecting foods that have a higher probability of causing early onset diabetes. A problem in North America that is literally reaching epidemic proportions. So if we look here, I forget if this is Canada or, no, this is the United States. Canada follows very, very closely. But look at in the last 20 years, the rate of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is skyrocketing. Just so you know, about 85% of the cases of diabetes are type 2 diabetes, not type 1. 15% is type 1, which is a genetic, a genetic abnormality which you're born with. So when we talk about type 2 diabetes, what's changed in the last 20 years that's really modified the way we consume foods? So in your lifetime, what has changed? Fast food. So fast food is a big one. Has anyone ever heard of a food swamp or a food desert? Did Evan Fraser talk about those at all? So what's a food swamp? Where there's a density of fast food. We spoke about it sometime back. Density of fast food places compared to some of those food Yep, exactly. So a food swamp is that there's healthy food options available, but there's more convenient, more cheap, readily available, highly processed foods available. Max convenience stores, McDonald's, Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, all the different fast food chains. When we talk about food security, specifically in North America, we don't necessarily think about a prevalence or an absence of available calories. Most people in Canada, not all, but most people in Canada have access to enough calories on a daily basis. In these areas of food swamps, and in the case of a food desert, where you can't get to a healthy food option store, this pre-selects that segment of the population to be exposed to foods which are far more highly refined, that are less expensive, that are implicated in causing type 2 diabetes. 
or foods that have a very, very high glycemic index. So imagine you are a single mother or a single parent, I guess it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you're a single parent living in Toronto or living in a city, Saskatoon. You can't afford a car. Chances are, if you can't afford a car, you can't afford public transportation. And even if you're going to use public transportation, if you have ever used public transportation in grocery shopping for more than one person, it becomes extremely difficult to do. So if you don't own a car and you don't have a, a, a supermarket within a five mile radius, chances are you're going to rely on very, very low quality foods. You're going to go to fast food places as well as convenience stores to do the to do most of your shopping. This is even exacerbated when you have children because if you're trying to convince your kid to eat an apple, which is going to cost you a dollar, a dollar fifty at a max convenience store, or a McDonald's cheeseburger, which is going to cost you 99 cents, which do you think the kid is going to cry for? Which food do you think the kid is going to cry for? The McDonald's hamburger. So all of this creates a very large disparity between socioeconomic status and whether or not you're more or less prevalent in the development of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion on for instance? Mm. It's tough. And I think, it, again, this is that whole concept of personalized nutrition. For the average person, so I remember when I was a student here and Booster Juice just came to campus. And I would see students lined up at Booster Juice with a meal in their hands as well. Those types of products are so calorie dense that they're meant to be an entire meal replacement, which very rarely people use the mass. On top of that, they are readily digestible, so they're going to have a very high glycemic index if there's a lot of carbohydrates in them. And if there's not a lot of carbohydrates, there's going to be a lot of fat, so they're going to have a high lipemic index and then just be implemented in inflammation. Where smoothies and refined beverages like that have a utility is in people that are training to be marathon runners or are doing extensive weight training, where you need a lot of metabolites very quickly. For the, most people in this room, there's really no need to consume them unless you're using them as a meal replacement. So, let's say, for instance, um, I, consume, I tend to consume smoothies about three times a week. Yeah. Um, okay. And that's because um, I find that the, the, the balance of the word is to consume as many apples. For instance, I'll put a pie in there, throw a lot of guys in there, but I can't eat those foods individually. Right. So Well, you tell me, what would, be, what would be the consequence of the glycemic index there? Uh, I will say this much, like, I've noticed that, like, when I consume the food, afterwards, I feel extremely lethargic. Okay. Okay, so why would a smoothie change your level of satiation many hours after you consume it? Many hours or short? Well, even minutes, hours, whatever it is. I guess So, so now you're, you're going to change your rate of gastric emptying. If you change your rate of gastric emptying, you're going to change, change your ileal break, your CCK, your satiety. All of that is interconnected. So again, the idea of convenience foods dominates society, especially once you're, well, once you hit university, you really start to rely on convenience foods. And that gets, again, kind of mod that gets magnified again when you begin to have children a lot of times because you know, I get off work at 5, my kids need to eat by 5.30, we have a half an hour window to prepare a meal. If we do that from scratch, it's going to be pressed. If I open a box of alfagetti or a can of alfagetti, I can do that in 15 minutes. The more you process foods, the more readily available the nutrients become. And again, in the case of a smoothie three times a week at your age, it's probably not a big deal. But if you were to do that late into your 60s all the way through, you would likely develop nutritionally related you would have nutritionally related consequences to your body. What they are, we have no idea. And this is something that we struggle with today in research and in formulating foods is 
we can tell very quickly if something's going to have an acute toxicity, right? I can feed it to you, I can measure inflammation, I can measure bio biochemical changes, and I can say that food is going to cause an acute toxicity. Melamine, for example. The challenge with the Western diet is that we don't have acute effects, really. So eating that smoothie or eating that highly refined food isn't going to do much to you on a daily basis, but over 30, 40 years, there's going to be consequences that we don't understand the effects on. Again, talking about just dentation and teeth and cooking. It took us 12,000 years to figure out that our tooth shot size changes in response to the introduction of fire. And again, the introduction of fire is just an, a, another form of processing that increases bioaccessibility. What about mastication or blending of that food? What about changing or decompartmentalizing foods using shear? What about combinations of nutrients that we didn't normally have together? All of those things are going to have biological consequences and all of them are going to change our genetics over time. They're going to act as an evolutionary discourse. We're going to talk about um, next week in lipid di Is it next week or this week? I forget. We'll talk about it in the next day or two. But our evolutionary path, so for example, if you evolved in one part of the world eating a diet low in carbohydrates versus another part of the world where you're, so it's going to be today we're going to talk about it, or in another part of the world where you have a low carbohydrate diet depending on your seasonally available crops, the amount of amylase gene replication you have or the amount of amylase protein you produce is genetically different and significantly so. So the food we eat changes the basis of our the basics of our genetics generation after generation and this whole area of the western diet we don't understand the long-term ramifications of it we have no idea so in the next two three hundred years we're going to see our genetic profile change in response to the western diet we see it in all different aspects of food now and we'll go over some of those examples in a minute is there a specific threshold of fat to sugar where this becomes we don't know. The honest answer is there's just not enough. Twofold. One is we can approximate acute effects, and that's easy to study. But if I would never get ethical approval to say that I'm going to take you and I'm going to feed you what I think is a really unhealthy diet for the next 30 years and then see if you die younger. You probably wouldn't want to sign up for that study, even if I put a $5 bonus on it. <laughs> that's usually what they are in university is like 5 to 50 bucks. So when you see this increase in the prevalence of diabetes, it's not just about the amount of food we eat. It's not about eating too many apples. It's about making too many wrong food choices. Chronically consuming overly processed, highly refined, biologically very accessible macronutrients. And we've seen, a, we're going to see a huge increase in the healthcare, well, in the prevalence of diabetes. And because it's a chronically managed disease, it becomes extremely, extremely expensive. This is going to put such a burden on our healthcare system in the next 25 years that it's going to become astronomical, which is great because it's going to keep everyone in this room employed for the next 50 to 100 years to try to solve these problems. And again, to think that it's not associated with the Western diet, there is so much mounting evidence that says, again, it's not just about the amount of food you eat, but it's, again, the degree to which that food has been processed plays a significant role in how our body responds, specifically with blood glucose. So the more we process that diet, the more likely you are to develop type 2 diabetes. Really great paper here comparing Australian Aboriginals who remain on a diet that they've evolved with or Aboriginals that have adapted to a more Western style diet living in major metropolitans and they can significantly see, so their genetics are for all intents and purposes, similar because they came from the same lineage and that break in the exposure to the diet has been relatively recent in history within their lifetime. 
There's significant differences in the prevalence of diabetes within these two populations. So to simply say that diabetes is associated with, again, the amount of food you eat is untrue. It's, it's specifically related to the amount of processing that that food has undergone. So when we talk about the glycemic index, we've talked about the absorption at the epithelial layer. We've talked about the fact that when sugar is absorbed, if it's not glucose, it has to be transformed into glucose by the liver. So either fructose or galactose go to the liver and are metabolized and converted to glucose. And this is all regulated by insulin. Now, I don't know why that side's it. I'm going to just jump that. Okay. So again, when we talk about a food, we have to remember that there's a system systematic breakdown of that polysaccharide into short oleosaccharides, and then those oleosaccharides are broken down into maltose. Maltose then arrives at the brush border of the small intestine, where it interacts with different brush border enzymes, breaking that down to glucose. Glucose is then transferred through the epithelial cell going into the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein takes that sugar to the liver. The liver then either metabolizes it, depending on what sugar it is, converts it to glucose, secretes it into the circulatory system, and then it's available for the skeletal muscle to uptake on response to insulin levels. So when we talk about the initiation of starch digestion, it begins in the mouth. Now, the degree of which alpha, alpha amylase plays a role in digestion in the oral cavity is dependent on the oral food processing time. So this is dependent on the residence time of that food in your oral cavity, right? The longer you keep the food in your mouth, the longer it's exposed to salivary amylase, the more carbohydrate digestion, that digestion that's going to take place. Depending on your evolutionary path, amylase gene replication, which we're going to talk about in a second, or the amount of salivary amylase you produce is dependent on a couple factors. One is environmental factors, how stressed you are, what types of food you chronically consume. It's also dependent on the copy number. How many replications of that allele within the genome do you have? So are you a super producer of amylase? Do you digest carbohydrates much faster than someone else? So the idea that a food has a single glycemic index is a very, very bad assumption. The glycemic index is going to be different for each one of you. So if you produce a lot of amylase, you're going to break down polysaccharides at a faster rate, right? If you break down carbohydrates at a faster rate, they're going to be available to be absorbed and enter the bloodstream at a faster rate, meaning that food is going to have a higher glycemic index. So again, this introduces this whole new area of per personalized nutrition, which can be based on the genetic profile of that individual. So what might be a healthy food choice for one person, let's say a, a carbohydrate rich meal with a person that's a low amylase producer, so they're going to have a lower glycemic index, so they're not going to have the detrimental effect from eating that one food. Whereas someone else that has a high replication number is going to produce a lot of salivary amylase or a lot of amylase, that means they're going to break down faster. That means that food's going to have a higher associated glycemic index. And we are moving into the area of personalized nutrition now. This is where a lot of the research is going. Not only is it from our genetic profile that it's important, but what else? Why else would be an argument that we should be considering each individual person for what they should be consuming? Yeah? Uh, because everyone has a different like, microbiome. Right. Uh, so the way they process nutrients or uh, absorb nutrients might differ. And the metabolites are different. So in the case of do you have an azo reductase producing bacteria which can metabolize artificial colors? So these are the things we've got to be able to think about. The, chat, the idea of a one nutrition for everyone is a very, very big misnomer that we really shouldn't be applying anymore when we don't have to. So the idea of a glycemic index for a food for you is going to be the same for the glycemic index for a food for someone else is, again, not a good attitude. <laughs> so when we talk about salivary amylase, just as a step back, there are very, very few studies that try to understand how foods change our genome. 
One of the reasons for it is it's very, very, very difficult to show cause and effect. For example, who here has heard of the French paradox? Why? Nobody's, yeah, okay. What is it? So cheese is part of it. French love their cheese. They love three things, which is a horrible uh, categorization of people, but the idea of the, fr the, the French paradox, they love their cheese, Butter. they love bread, bread wine. and wine. So from that, epidol, epidol, ep, epi, I can't say it. My brain's just not getting the word for me. Epiological study. I'm not saying it right, but anyhow. Based on that observation that French people typically have the lowest cholesterol, yet eat a diet that's very, very high in saturated fat, right? So high in saturated fat, low cholesterol. It's backwards, right? If you eat a high, sat a high saturated fat diet, you're going to have high cholesterol. So what does everyone draw the conclusion then? Well, it must be the amount of wine they drink. And then from that, they go and they say, well, there's bioactives in wine, things like resveratrol, that are very, very good antioxidants. Then they start to say that resveratrol plays a role in health. Well, the studies that show resveratrol as being a beneficial compound in foods, the amount of resveratrol exposed to cells is equivalent to a few thousand bottles of wine a day. So, to get the health benefits of resveratrol from the early studies, you would have to become a raging alcoholic, <laughs> of which any benefit you got from that resveratrol is long exceeded by the detriments of consuming alcohol. But those types of studies happen, and we make these observations that we then decide on making food choice. There's another one that we're going to talk about next week, and it's one that bothers me so much. So, in the 1970s, there was an observation that Danes, so people from Denmark, had significantly higher cholesterol than people from Greenland. Right? So what did they conclude? Again, everyone in nutrition should be familiar with this observation in the 1970s. What came out of that observation? So, Greenland Inuit had significantly lower LDL, bad cholesterol, and the results kind of were on the fence for HDL, but the, the general statement is that Greenland and you had, had higher HDL. So the HDL LDL ratio was lower, or sorry, was higher for the Greenland and you had than the Danes, which is a great marker for cardiovascular health. They found that cardiovascular disease was almost non prevalent in the, in the Inuit population, whereas the incidence of stroke was much higher for the, in, the Inuit compared to the Danes. And what did they conclude from that? Anyone know? That it must be diet related. And what is the primary component of a diet for someone living in Greenland? Does anyone know? Like seal? Fish. fish, cold water fish, and a really big fish or mammal. No, I think it's a fish. Whale. Whale fat. Those are all high in. <laughs> Omegas, right? Your omega-3, your omega-6 fatty acids. So this is where the idea of unsaturated fats being good for us came from. Now, the downfall to that study was in Greenland. They chose hunters and their spouses. What do you think the level of physical activity of a typical hunting Inuit, someone that's getting in a boat, going out to sea every day, fishing, coming home and processing that fish compared to a Dane is. We spend about eight hours a day at a desk on average in Western society. So the amount of physical activity would be drastically different in those two studies. So to make a conclusion that it's based on only diet is absolutely ludicrous. Now, the other thing that makes me so angry is that CNN picks this story up and they say, fish, cold water fish is good for you. Well, yeah, it is. But no, it's not. And why isn't it? So if I go and I go fishing and I catch a fish, I cut off its head, I skin it, and I cook it and eat it, the biochemistry of that meat is going to be significantly different than if I 
troll, I'm, I'm out in the Atlantic trolling, get a whole bunch of fish, I process it in Eastern Canada, I then freeze it, I then ship it across the country, I freeze it until you buy it, you buy it, you freeze it, and then you take it, batter it, and deep fry it. The fats that were stable at cold temperatures that were eaten typically uncooked, and now we're taking it and putting it at 250 to 350 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes, and we think the nutritional profile of that cold water fish is the same as eating it raw? We'll see why that's not a good assumption to make. But it made the observation that unsaturated oils should be a significant part of our diet. So coming back to this, when a population is chronically exposed to its food source, depending on how different those food sources are, again, our evolutionary path changes. We saw this with the change in dentation size with the introduction of fire. And in populations where there was an earlier, earlier introduction in fire, so northern climates, we have less dentation than in populations in southern climates where fire wasn't controlled for cooking for thousands of years later. So it's changed our evolutionary path, the introduction of fire. The exposure to carbohydrates has also had an impact on our evolutionary path. So there's two papers that I want to talk about. The first one is low copy number of salivary amylase predisposes individuals to obesity. So we have to take a jump back to first year biology. So when we talk about the human genome, there's about 3,000 base, 3 billion base pairs on 23 different chromosomes. A gene can be anywhere from a few base pairs to a few thousand base pairs. And a gene encodes for a specific protein. Proteins are the enzymes that metabolize food, that control cellular uptake, that control the way our body works. An allele are two different copies of the same gene that have either an addition, a deletion, or a variation. So two alleles will produce two different proteins. Those proteins may be functionally different, or they may have different functional activities. So, does anyone know why sickle cell anemia is prevalent in African populations, but not in Western society, or not as prevalent? Um, I think it might be a maladaptive trait. So, like, it's not a trait that significantly uh, affects diversity, so it has a bit spike. Well, it does, it does have a significant, two very significant biological effects. One is that it has a much poorer ability to carry oxygen. The second one, anyone know what the second one is? Right. The adaptation or that genetic favorism of the gene which causes sickle cell anemia was an adaptive trait in response to chronic exposure to malaria. So your body was trying to adapt its blood cells so it couldn't be infected with malaria. Now, there's all different kinds of alleles and all different disease states associated with alleles. Now, in copy number, what that means, I don't think this is going to work, but we'll see. Oh, the pointer works. So in salivary amylase, they've identified the gene AM1, AMY1, which is right here. And that gene, depending on your evolutionary path can be replicated. So instead of having a single gene for it, we can have multiple copies. And that number of copies can vary between about 1 and 15. So if you produce 15, genetic, 15 copies of that gene, you're going to produce 15 times the amount of enzymes. It's not linear related. We'll look at it in a second. So they're not, where's that slide? There we go. So if we look at the AMY copy number and we look at BMI, BMI goes down as AMY copy number goes up. So it doesn't mean just because you have a high AMY1 copy number, it doesn't mean you're going to be obese. But if you are obese, you have a higher tendency to have less AMY1 copy numbers. Why is this important? Well, we can use that now as a screening tool 
for young people on whether or not they are more likely to be obese later in life. And we can make dietary interventions based on your genetic profile. That is the whole concept of personalized nutrition. And it's becoming extremely, extremely promising. And it seems like it would be in a very expensive way to actually manage a population. But if you think of the long-term healthcare costs associated with treating chronic diseases, per personalized nutrition to prevent chronic diseases could be a huge cost savings. So if, again, if you look at then breaking this just down into obesity classes based on your BMI, so, so I'll just mention the Twins UK study and the, uh, the Desiree study, these were just genetic, these were studies that were done where the whole, gene, the whole human genome was collected. These studies came after those studies and they data mined it. So they were looking for the AMY gene. So it was a secondary study. It wasn't the primary purpose of either of those studies. But again, they showed that the copy number is inversely proportionate to the likelihood of you being obese or not. Now, this doesn't mean that because you produce, overproduce amylase, you're going to be obese. It doesn't have any, that's, that's not the same thing, that you're, you're going kind of out of order if you say that. But the higher the gene number at that locus is associated to have evolved with our consumption of a high carbohydrate rich diet. So they cite a paper in here, which is diet and the evolution of the human amylase gene. And what they found was that if you look at the amount of salivary amylase produced, so it's very difficult to look at how much amylase you're producing in your pancreas. So instead, it's much, much easier and more simple to measure amylase in your saliva. You can just spit and measure the amount of protein. If you look, you can see that there is a linear correlation between your AMY1 gene copy number, so 1 to 15 along the bottom, and the amount of protein you produce. There's a lot of variability, and that variability is associated with environmental factors. But there is a genetic basis for the amount of amylase you produce. And again, if you're talking about the glycemic index, this can have ramifications. So if you have a high a, uh, AMY1 copy number, you should be eating either foods that have very complex carbohydrates or foods that are lower in carbohydrates. So you don't get that same glycemic response. Now what they did is they subdivided their results based on populations that were exposed to drastically different diets. So they had the high starch, her high starch diets, which were Japanese, European American, low starch diets, which were Yakut, I, I can't pronounce those, I apologize. But what you can see is the low starch diets typically had higher populations at lower gene copy numbers, whereas high starch diets, the dark colored lines, had significantly lower numbers at higher populations. So you could actually differentiate populations based on the copy number which was directly proportionate to the amount of starch that they consumed. So again, it shows that our body can adapt to the foods we are eating, which shouldn't be surprising. Food is an evolutionary discourse. If you've read anything by Darwin, remember Darwin on his Galapagos Islands, he would go into a cave and he would find fish and insects that had evolved that didn't have eyes because there was no light down there, so they didn't need them. Same thing with food. Food is a significant evolutionary discourse. Our body and our genome is constantly adapting to the foods we consume. So if we eat a high starch versus a low starch diet, it's going to change the very basics, basis of our genetic profile and our biochemistry. So the idea that there's a one-fit solution for people from all over the world is again a very bad notion. And that our history of how our ancestors have consumed foods will change how our body responds to that food, right? Which makes sense. If you come from a lineage that's been consuming lactose or milk for many, many generations, chances are gene expression for lactose is going to remain with you later in life and you're not going to become lactose intolerant. Whereas if you come from a population that doesn't rely on dairy and the only milk you get is very early on in life, 
it makes sense that your body would adapt to not utilize energy to make lactose transporters in your epithelial cell. So you become lactose intolerant. So these genetic changes, again, are prevalent all throughout society. We just don't know what they are. So when food enters the body, it's not only how the enzymes degrade that food, but it's also based on the changes in physical chemistry of that food itself. Again, when we talk about the breakdown in the gastric compartment, it's highly dependent on the structure and solubility and sensitivity to pH that is in that gastric compartment. And we've talked about this, right? We talked about the importance of the pH of 3.5 for an infant's stomach and the pKa of dairy proteins. pKa of dairy proteins is very close to that of the, iso of the pH of an infant's stomach. Why? So that milk can coagulate and form a solid in the stomach. Why does that happen? So it slows down gastric emptying. Slowing down gastric emptying allows for increased exposure of gastric lipase. In an infant, that's extremely important because its pancreas isn't fully ready or doesn't secrete enough lipase to actually break down that fat. So by keeping it in the stomach as a, as a solid for a longer period of time facilitates digestion with, with lipases that are not mediated by bile. So all of this is important. So when we talk about the breakdown of carbohydrates, even though there's not a significant amount of enzymatic breakdown in the stomach, there are major, major structural changes that are taking place. We talked about this. We talked about breaking down that pectin, that intercellular matrix material that holds those cells together. The amount of oral food processing changes that. The biggest change that we have done to our foods is through refining and processing foods. So every time we refine or process a food, you think of a bran flake. So in your breakfast cereal, how water soluble that is or how, how quickly that hydrates when you put it into a glass of milk. It becomes soggy really qu quickly. Take an unprocessed oat and put it into water. It doesn't swell. Then you take a steel cut oat and you put it into water and it swells a little bit. Take an instant oat and put it into water and it swells very quickly. The glycemic index of those three oats, which have been killed, killed and rolled, are significantly different. So each one of those, as the processing goes up, the glycemic index goes up. The carbohydrates that are there are the same, the sugars that are there are the same, but the rate in which they break down differs based on the physiochemical properties of that food. And this is an area that's only become active in research in the last 15 years. So, again, when we talk about amylase and the importance of amylase, not only is it important from a complex or linear versus nonlinear carbohydrate, so in linear, am so alpha amylase, let's say, we break it down to the smaller molecules, to the maltose, which can then be broken down into glucose at the brush border. When we talk about amylopectin, it becomes a little bit different in which, in how those break down, because now we get a significant production of, of the limit dextrins, which are much more difficult to break down at the brush border. So this changes automatically the lipemic index simply based on the ratio of the amylose to amylopectin, which is made up of the starch granule, which differs based on its source. If it's a tapioca starch, if it's a corn starch, whatever it may be. Now, if we change the rate at which they break down, we can change the metabolic response to that food. So there's all kinds of work being done on trying to substitute linear, highly digestible carbohydrates with highly branched carbohydrates to change the glycemic index. The reason it becomes difficult to do is the functionality of those polymers change as we induce branching into them. Now, for the agriculture students in the back, we don't often tie into or we don't often see connections to what we're doing within different areas of food science. Well, amylase plays an important role in many, many aspects of the food industry. Brewing being the first. So for anyone who enjoys beer, one of the first most important steps to producing high quality beer is the germination project, pro pro the germination step. And that's where Carbo complex carbohydrates, which cannot be metabolized by yeast, are converted to simple sugars. So without controlling that process, 
we don't get the simple sugars needed to undergo fermentation. So the whole industry of brewing relies on amylase. Ruminant nutrition relies on amylase. So remember when we talked about corn production? About 5,000 farms in, in Canada is sufficient to produce enough of the sweet corn niblets frozen on the cob or canned? The rest goes to either grains and starches and oils. The other half goes to silage. To increase the amount of sugars present in the silage, you treat it with amylase. Why is that good? It improves the nutrient density of that, of that silage for the cattle. So if you increase the amount of sugar that cow is eating, you're going to increase the amount of not only milk it's producing, but the amount of fat which that cow is producing. And you sell, pro, you sell milk based on the amount of fat that is in that milk. So again, when we talk about the glycemic index, it's the rate in which blood sugar, your blood sugar goes up. Different foods have different responses. Glucose has the highest, obviously, right? Because it doesn't need to be changed before it's absorbed. So really the rate limiting step is the rate in which you're going to absorb it. White bread is, has the next highest glycemic index. Why? Well, because the structure of it breaks down very quickly in the stomach. So now we're just converting that amylase and into glucose. But if we take a whole lentil, again, we're talking now something that has a cellular structure. The starch granules are compartmentalized into cells. You've got to break down the cell to get to the starch. So it adds another processing step that's required to get that glucose to be readily available to be absorbed. So we always compare the glycemic index, and there's two different glycemic indexes, which makes no sense, and I don't know why there's two different ones. One is based on the response to pure glucose. So that's the second column over here, which I'm off, there we go. So in response to pure glucose, so if you look at glucose, glycemic index is 1 or 100. In the other one, it's compared to white bread. Again, doesn't matter which one you look at, the changes are all relatively the same. So let's look at the monosaccharides first. We've got sucrose, we've got fructose, and we've got sucrose. So either a disaccharide or a monosaccharide. So if we look at sucrose, now the advancer is working. That makes no sense. No, it's not. So let's look at glucose. So again, everything's relative to glucose. So fructose will require an extra processing step to increase your blood sugar level, right? It gets absorbed, so it gets transported across using the GLUT5 and then GLUT2 into the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, where does it go? The hepatic portal vein, which carries that fructose to the liver, where it's converted to glucose. So now, that profile has become less pronounced. Now, if we take sucrose, now it's got to be broken down at the brush border, so there's another step. Now the glucose and the fructose absorb differently. The fructose then has to go off to the liver and be converted, and now we get an intermediate glycemic index. So the response is dependent on the actual monosaccharides that are present. Now what happens if we add a polysaccharide? Well now we've got to wait for the alpha amylase to break it down which breaks down to maltose. That maltose can go to the brush border, be broken down by maltase. It then has two glucose molecules, and now that glucose can be absorbed. But now look at the glycemic response. Now it's much slower, much more gradual. So the rate limiting step becomes that cleavage using alpha amylase. But it goes beyond that. Again, Every time you process a food, every time you change that structure, you are increasing its digestibility. So you take canola seeds. You crush that canola seed and you break out that native structure of the cell. The oil, let's say, comes out as oil body. So now there's a monolayer of molecules around that oil. We remove those because we want a nice, clear, clean oil with really high triglyceride content. All of a sudden now, the digestibility of soybean oil is very, very different than the digestibility of fat from soybeans.
They behave nothing alike. So it doesn't matter how good a soybean is for you. It matters now that it's as an oil, and that oil has a different biological availability, and we have to understand what the implications of that are, and we don't. But we can see that if we add a viscous fiber, we see increasing the amount of guar gum decreases the glycemic index. So we can now do strategies to change the glycemic index of food, processed foods, by adding novel ingredients. So the biggest fad now everyone's trying to do, throw fiber into your food, right? Why? Fiber's cheap because typically it's not a good food source, so cellulose, alginates, pectins. We can add those to foods to increase the viscosity. Why would you want to increase the viscosity? That's going to change the rate of gastric emptying. That's going to change the rate of your ileal break. That's going to change the satiation that that food gives to you. Not only that, it's going to change the glycemic index. index. So by chronically consuming, let's say your oatmeal with a little bit of protein, that's going to change the rate in which the sugars are metabolized in that oat. So their study just came out at the University of Guelph where they took Cheerios and they put milk and different um, polysaccharides in it and looked at the glycemic response and they changed. Now, it's very, very difficult to infer more than that change on a chronic consumption, what that's going to mean over thousands of years or hundreds of years or decades or whatever, and a differing population. So for one person, it may have a significant effect. For a second person, it may not have a significant effect. Again, bringing us back to that concept of personalized nutrition. So when we talk about food processing and the glycemic index, increasing the degree of processing increases the glycemic index. Increasing the amount of readily available carbohydrates or the glycemic load negatively impacts insulin resistance. And cooking increases the glycemic index. So everything the food industry does to foods is detrimental from the Western diet perspective. And what happens when we continually push that limit? What happens when we're chronically consuming very high sugar, very rich carbohydrates that are digestible, and we push that limit of homostasis? We continually consume foods with a high glycemic index, when we continually fo eat foods with high glycemic index, we overproduce insulin, and by chronically exposing our GLUT4 transporters to high levels of insulin, they become insensitive. That means that it becomes more and more difficult to remove that blood glucose. That means that you get early onset diabetes. So again, if we look at highly processed foods, so this is just an example where they compared unprocessed foods, so boiled rice versus sweet corn and potato, versus six foods, so instant rice, so instant rice has been boiled, gelatinized, and then dried. Or what are the other ones? Um, instant rice, I don't know what rice bubbles are. Corn chips, corn flakes, instant potatoes, and potato crisps. They found that in all but one instance, the processed food had a higher glycemic index than the unprocessed food and the exception was potato chips. And that doesn't make sense, that does, sorry, that does make sense because the potato chip will have a much harder structure than a potato, uh, a raw uncooked potato. So again, everything we do in the Western diet pre-selects for foods that have a high glycemic index. Now, I say this as though it's very, yeah. Sorry, are we, so are we reaching this point where we're trying to add more fiber to our processed foods to make them more like? Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you see that going? Well, the, adding fiber to your diet is a good thing. I don't think it matters if you add it as a, as a whole food or as a processed food. So if you're going to eat a processed food that has or does not have fiber, I think it's beneficial. But will it change consumers' attitude towards processed foods, causing them to eat more processed foods? That's the worry. Yeah? Um, so with this talk of like, glycemic index, like, does glycemic index really matter when you eat food? Um, because I'm saying that like, we're not just going to be eating, for instance, a bowl of rice, right? We'd be eating like, protein, vegetables, fat, all of mm -hmm. it, and all of these things combined together is sure. the glycemic index. Yep. So is it like, even plausible to conclude that 
um, certain foods have a higher glycemic index, because we would be naturally pairing it up with other foods that may alter like the actual glycemic index. Yeah, it's a great question. So absolutely. So would a, a cup full of cornflakes have the same glycemic index of a, a bowl of cereal with milk in it? It wouldn't, no. So yes, the challenge is everything we're doing to the food industry is moving everything to higher glycemic indexes. So you can, an educated person, that it, I, and when I say educated, I mean someone that has a really good understanding of food chemistry, could make pairings that would always lower glycemic index. The vast majority of the population is absolutely oblivious to it. Right? So their food choice, their food pairings is totally hedonic based, right? It's based on uh, interactions between the foods from a sensory profile as well as meal preparation, right? So it, it becomes very difficult to say that you could pair foods or complex meals would negate the need for a glycemic index. If we, ha if we introduced one processed food into a highly unprocessed diet, then yes, your, your point would be spot on. Problem is, we're pairing a whole bunch of highly processed, highly refined foods. Does that make sense? Having said that, the food industry has re done remarkable, remarkable things. The increase in life expectancy in the last 200 years is because of two things. The increase or the, the, the improvements to modern medicine, but also the availability of quality food, quality calories. So the introduction of meat as a commodity that was readily available is correlated to a change in average height, right? Because you have a complete protein that's readily bioaccessible. So we've done amazing things. We have likely hit the maximum longevity we're going to see on our diet. There's studies that are starting to come out now that say your generation, my generation, is going to be the first generation to have a decrease in average life expectancy based on diet. So all the advents of modern medicine that we've done, they're soon going to be negated because of diet. So the diet we consume today the chronic consumption of that diet is what's going to limit average life expectancy, right? That's why the world now sees more cases of mortality associated with chronic diseases than germs and bugs. First time in human history that that's happened. So it's completely changed the UN's notion of how to treat disease because more people suffer from chronic diet-related diseases. The other thing that this has done, which is another a really good area of food science, is that introduction of nutrigenomics, which is going to be the next kind of era of food science and nutrition, is going to be this whole area of personalized nutrition based on your genetic profile, which is really, really exciting. But we have to now rethink the food industry and how we process foods because obesity, metabolic syndrome, chronic diseases associated with diet are starting to become the, preter the predominant, the determinant of life expectancy in Western society. So if we want to see our life expectancy get out of the 70s and into the 80s and 90s for an average population, we're going to have to rethink the way we process foods. And with that, we're done carbohydrates and we're going to move into lipids next week.